Maeve, hiya. Yeah, Hi, good morning. Just want Thanks to say hello. And, well, thanks um, for having me. And pretty welcome. Hi, Catherine so and Jim, June, Mary. Um, are you okay, Maeve? I'm I'm sort of just um, overriding everyone because I, I'm introducing Maeve earlier or later on. So I just want to say hi and you're okay, Maeve. All good, absolutely. Can Great. you hear me okay? I, very well, yeah. I took something yes. off your website, so it's sort of like just um <laughs> almost like focusing say it back to you, you know. So um and okay. then you can take it from there. And Jim is up in the corner there and he's on your he's he's our techie today or Driving, okay, so, driving the desk, I think it's called. <laughs> so I suppose you know from our accents that we're probably both from Ireland, Maeve's across maybe three villages away. Um, she has the Blarney Stone on her plate, so that's why she's better <laughs> talking than me. She has it, I, I don't know, it's coaches very near Blarney anyway. Um, and I just took some yeah. of this from her. Her website, uh, she said she has lived a blessed life through her uh, 50 plus years and she has spent most of that years, years trying to find out how the world works and how people, including herself, forged their way within it. And that led her to an academic life in many respects, thinking that the answers could be found in, in gathering knowledge and to a certain extent, the degrees and qualifications that reflect a journey. And somewhere along the way, she met her present husband, her now husband, Andrew, and her three boys. Um, Maeve discovered to take control through working with the spiritual universal laws, assume 100% responsibility for my for her results and create the support structures. So I think that you you um, want to work, work with parts. I think that was the the, the, the idea of that. And just to acknowledge Lynn that it's her YouTube channel and like we're all very grateful for being here on that. Um so best luck babe. Enjoy. Oh <laughs> thanks. Okay. Well <laughs> folks it, it's an honor and a privilege to be with you today. And thank you sincerely to Pauline for the invitation and Lynn for having me. Um, I'm very, and all of you for, for making the time to be together here this morning. And, and it's true what, what Pauline chose from my website. And I do feel like I've spent my entire adult life trying to understand how the world works, probably as a child too, but, but not always aware that that was what I was trying to figure out. And, and focusing for sure has been part of my journey. And, and I feel very privileged to be a certified focusing practitioner. Um, I, I first came across co focusing, I think it was about 2007 or eight. Um, and I stayed in the study and through, uh, since then, I've been very blessed to have been in a focusing partnership uh, with the same person for about 15 years. And, and we endeavor to meet weekly, but don't always pull that off. Sometimes it's fortnightly, sometimes even a month could go by. But for the most part, I am a focusing practitioner. But I'm saying that with a, with a slight qualification in so much as I haven't really stayed in the study of focusing in all this time. So I, I do it as a practice, but I'm conscious that um, the language and the terminology may be a bit lost to me. So um, forgive me if I don't use focusing terminology as we talk today. And, and I'm very conscious of what's alive in me at the moment is that in that context, you might uh, be unhappy with me in some way that I'm not coming here as a focusing expert. Um, but I'm going to share with you what, what I know works in my experience, and, and I'm sure we'll find the language together. And I'm also going to share with you a couple of other ideas um, that I bring to coaching. My, I, most of my work in the world now is as a coach and a facilitator of workshops. And um, so I'm going to share with you some ideas from my coaching work that, again, I believe are very supportive of anything we might like to, to create in terms of our caring relationships and how we might like to resource ourselves to be our best in those relationships. So I'll maybe just pause there and, and check if anybody wants to ask a question already. Um, and, and if not, I'll go into sharing some ideas. Are we okay? <laughs> okay. Thanks so much. Okay. So 
let's just maybe do what you would probably normally do at the start of one of these calls and that is to just come into presence a little bit so if, if it feels comfortable for you to close your eyes maybe do that if not maybe just focus on um, something in the room around you and just inviting you to to notice um your your right foot and, and the feel of your right foot, maybe within your shoe or your slipper, the feel of your foot on the floor. And then just notice your left calf and your left knee. And then inviting you to bring your attention to your, your sitting bones in the seat or the chair that you're in at the moment, feeling the support of the chair. Maybe feeling the small of your back against the back of the chair. Yeah, and manage to maybe mute or put yourselves on silent. So then noticing your right shoulder, your left ear, the tip of your nose on the top of your head. So sometimes we use this practice as a kind of body scan to come into presence. And I'm hoping that that's been your awareness and, and, and part of your experience. I also want to invite you to notice today just that capacity within you to direct your noticing around your body. You were able to bring your attention to different body parts as I invited you to do so. And now I maybe want to add something that might not be part of your normal settling in. And that is to notice your thinking. So notice what are the kind of thoughts you're having in this moment? Maybe you had some technology problems and, and you know, you're feeling some of the anxiety around that. Maybe you're feeling comfortable or thinking, you know, this is nice. I now have this period of time to be together with my focusing friends. Maybe you're thinking, should have gone to the loo before we started. It doesn't matter what you're thinking. What I'm inviting you is to not have judgment around any of that and really to notice your own capacity to notice your thoughts while you're thinking them. I invite you to notice how you're feeling in this moment. Again, maybe you're feeling comfortable. Maybe you're feeling curious. Maybe you're feeling surprised. Maybe you're feeling... Again, anxious about the technology, whatever it is. Again, no judgment for the feelings that are there. What I want to invite you to pay attention to this morning is again to notice that capacity in you to notice how you're feeling while you're feeling it. Then when you're ready, just inviting you to bring your attention back present here to the Zoom room and to each other within it. And I want to ask that question, which maybe you've asked yourself before, or maybe it's new for you. But the question I want to invite you to consider is who in you does the noticing? Who in you was able to notice, you know, what you're thinking, notice what you're feeling and know that you're separate from that. You're not your thoughts. You're not your feelings. Who in you is able to direct your attention around your body? or indeed around the, the, the space around you and know that you're separate from all of that, that you are not, you are not, you are not your body. So inviting a response to that, if you want to come off mute or, or write it into the chat, but who, who in us does that, that noticing, that observing, that witnessing might be words we'd use. Would they like to share pure awareness? Steph is saying, yes, yes. So the Buddhists maybe sometimes call that the witness self or the observer self. Lynn, did you want to come in? I see you off mute. 
my name is BJ. Some uh, uh, folks in fo some folks in focusing call that presence. Yeah, self in presence is that is that what we would say? Yeah. So that that we have a capacity to 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 have an awareness in psychology, we call it metacognition, that capacity to notice what I'm thinking as I'm thinking it. So that that side of our nature, sometimes I, I Pierre Teilhard de Chardin talks about we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. And I, I believe that to be fundamentally true. And again, that this that might be a, a phrase or a concept that is new to you or it might be very familiar to you. But as spiritual beings having this human experience, we know there's a side of us knows that we have this spiritual side to our nature that's bigger than all of what we're experiencing in any given moment. That's I often say to clients that, you know, we are within us we have more power and more potential than any circumstance any situation or any condition and it's that that noticing side or that self in present side that that side that connect with that can connect with pure awareness that's the part of us that knows that we are more and i i think gendlin speaks about this in the context sometimes of um the the felt sense so let me just share um, sorry, that's the PDF. I have these in slides as well. Um, he, I want to share a quote with you from Gendlin where he talks about this. And he says, the felt sense lets one discover that one is not the felt sense. And when one has a felt sense, one becomes more deeply oneself. So I want to invite us to consider today that this capacity to notice that, yes, I have a felt sense. Yes, I have certain thoughts about a situation. Yes, I have feelings about a particular person or scenario in my life or, or you know, my, my, my caring role, however that may be defined for any of us, that I'm not defined by that. And, and it, it, it doesn't it doesn't make me who I am. It's it's just part of of the overall whole. And this capacity for me to notice those thoughts, to notice those feelings, to notice um, how I am in any given moment is is in that moment of awareness. It gives me opportunity and choice about what it is I want to do next or about how I can show up in ways that best serve me or best serve the person that I am in relationship with. So when we when we think about this and when we think about being kind of spiritual beings, having a human experience, maybe let me just check for a moment can you give me a thumbs up or, or a response in terms of whether that resonates does that sit with you as, as an idea that we're spiritual beings having a human experience okay okay perfect that's good to know and um, so if if we think of ourselves that we are spiritual beings having a human experience then i believe our emotions are giving us um constant guidance constant signals constant um signposts in terms of what's serving me or not serving me in the moment. So if I were to explain it, sometimes again with, with clients, I talk about how we experience longings and discontents. And th those are kind of our soul signals or, or signals from spirit kind of saying to us, you know, the longings are, you know, this this is for you, yet, you know, pursue this idea or, or this longing, this, this sense of I, I'd like to have that in my life, have that experience, have that relationship, have that result in some way, have that financial freedom or time freedom. And the discontents, I believe, again, are soul signals, uh, signs from spirit or God or the universe, life, love, that are saying to us, not for you, not for you. There's an opportunity here to change something that will allow you to become more of who you are here to be. So those, those signals are information for us in terms of who we are becoming and what, what will enable us to grow. And 
the emotion that we feel around it. So there's information in the in the emotion for sure and 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 working through focusing to tune into that and to have a relationship with with the felt sense around all of what gives us the opportunity to transform it one of one of the things i want to posit here today in in appreciative inquiry they use the phrase provocations which are not intended to provoke even though it, it sounds like a similar word, but a provocation is like um, a stimulation for our thinking. So one of the provocations for me today is, is to share here amongst us that it takes, and, and this is what the, the, the science is telling us, that it takes 90 seconds to process an emotion. And after that, if that emotion stays charged within us, it's in, in the words of Eckhart Tolle, he would say, we're adding a story. We're adding a story. And it is the story that is recharging that emotion within us all the time. So oftentimes, while, you know, as I said, I, I, am, I am a committed focuser myself, I, I think sometimes we can get a little bit stuck in the emotion and Gendlin would say this himself it's not about associating with the feelings it's not about getting lost in the feelings or the emotions but about allowing the, the full um, awareness of it to be felt and in, in the moment of the feeling it it gets shifted it gets shifted so what I want to offer today and this this is a kind of focusing approach that I use with my own clients to support us in, in being with the emotion, but not getting overly identified with it, to be able to just allow ourselves to feel it, but to stay in connection with the part of us that is more than the feeling at the same time. And, and so this is just a tool for kind of doing what many of you are, are probably doing all the time at the moment. So, you know, it's, it's just another way of expressing it. Um, but I want to invite you maybe into this feeling of noticing what I'm noticing. So that's our core tool, I think, to notice I've been triggered. This emotion is alive in me at this moment or um, this is how I'm feeling. And when we notice it, to use the great focusing language, that part of me is feeling that. OK, so part of me is feeling overwhelmed. Part of me is feeling anxious. Part of me is feeling, you know, whatever whatever the language is that that's associated with that feeling and i want to invite you to just bring so let's let's kind of do this as a practice in the moment so you can experience it so so maybe you know what whatever it is you're feeling right now to invite yourself to just put a name to that part of me is feeling x or y and and it's okay if that's vague as well you mightn't fully know as you're discovering it but part of me is feeling X. And I want to invite you to notice where you would locate that feeling in the body again, you know, so usually between the throat and, and the tummy in, in some space there, we can, we can feel where that emotion or, or feeling is felt. So you may wish to put your hand there or not, as the case may be, just be in awareness of where you can feel it. And again, as, as we would often do in, in you know, kind of classic focusing, if, if you were to imagine that that feeling had a color, what would be the color? So inviting you to give, you know, that, that area a color. And I want to invite you to also locate in this moment that part of you that is aware that you're more than the feeling, that part of you that we connected when we came on the call together, that has an awareness that, yes, I'm a spiritual being having a human experience and that I am more than my thoughts and my feelings and my reactions. And inviting you to, again, locate where do I feel that awareness in my body, that knowing of, of my spiritual side, that connection with, with the spiritual side of my nature. Where do you feel that in your body?
And as you connect with that feeling and that felt sense in the body, inviting you to give that a color too. If, if it had a color, what would be the color that you would give it? So in this moment, we have an awareness of, of kind of two felt senses that that part of me that that feels that connection with a power greater than myself and the part of me that that was feeling an emotion. And they both have a color and they both have a location in the body. Inviting you to imagine we we. Sometimes the language I use here is that we want to bring great compassion to the part of us that that, you know, was feeling an emotion that was uncomfortable in some way. Or maybe even if for you, it was a happy emotion or an expansive emotion this morning that you connected with. It's still very welcome. But tuning into the part of that and, and bringing great compassion if there was challenge or trigger or, or contraction in some kind. To, to feel that emotion today and inviting you to bring great compassion to it. And from that part that, that knows that we're more, that knows that we have a, a higher power within us, we bring that compassion to that other part. And if you would, almost like we imagine that we're wrapping a, a, a warm blanket around it. And, and using the color from the part that knows and, and connects with the spiritual side of your nature, almost like you're wrapping that color cloak around the part that was triggered or that for whatever reason you brought into your awareness when I first asked you to identify an, an emotion or a felt sense to engage with for this exercise. So you're not trying to obliterate the color that's there. We're not trying to obliterate the feeling that was there or, or to overwhelm it. We're just bringing compassion and imagining like we're we're wrapping the two up together and, and they're they're merging, they're blending. Neither one is, is kind of overcoming the other, but it's like we're reclaiming that part in a way that allows it still to be. And it's still it's still wrapped in the awareness and the assurance that that I'm more than that. I am more than that. And maybe just noticing what it what happens in the body when we're able to do that, when we're able to bring that kind of compassion and to be able to stay in presence using maybe the, the analogy of the colors and, and, and the wrapping around to, to be able to stay in presence while also being able to acknowledge the part that, that feels whatever it is feeling. So yeah, maybe just inviting if any of you are interested or willing to share how 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 did that feel as a means of of really supporting myself to stay in presence when when I'm also aware of a part of me that's feeling challenged or triggered or whatever it might be. You want to raise a hand or yes, June. I also felt another feeling of joy about having oh. my different parts. Like, okay. um, I mean, Beautiful. yeah, I had an experience I'll talk about later, but um, yeah, it's like, okay, I have all these parts and I can feel joy that I have all these parts. Yes. Yes, exactly. They make us who we are for sure. They're all part of the makeup. And, and again, oftentimes I talk about people, like the, we, I kind of reduce it as, as best I can to, you know, parts and ideas and, and thoughts and feelings. Some of them feel expansive. Some of them feel contractive and, and we don't want to make them right or wrong. They just, they just are what they are and they're all part of our experience. 
the way the way I work with it in coaching, though, is is to say that in a world where everything is vibration. OK, so again, I, I don't know if this resonates with people or not, but every thought and every feeling is is emitting a, a kind of a, a vibrational frequency. Is, is that an idea that people are familiar with? OK, I see people nodding again. Yeah. So we know if ever, so, so and these these as, as thoughts and and feelings, those frequencies, you know, are on a scale. So and, and this has been measured. I can't remember the name of the person who measured them, but they go from very low frequency vibrations right up to very high frequency vibrations. So the, the more contractive thoughts and, and feelings have low frequency vibrations and, and the, the more expansive ones have high frequency vibrations. And in a world where everything is frequency and vibration and, and like attracts like, we know that when we are thinking and emoting from low frequency vibrations, we're going to attract more of those thoughts and feelings and experiences into our lives. And when we are thinking from higher thoughts and, and, and emotions, emoting from, from higher frequencies, again, law of attraction means that we are going to attract in more of, of like thoughts, like feelings and the experiences that correlate with that. So while I do believe in being open and welcoming to, to everything that we are experiencing, I also believe that it's very important not to get stuck in contractive thoughts and emotions because we are going to perpetuate whatever it is that we we get stuck on. <laughs> you know, what we focus on expands. So if we are very, uh, so I don't mean focusing now in, in the strict focusing Gendlin term here, but when, when we're focusing on something and giving it our attention, we are going to be creating more of that. So, so the exercise we just did is the exercise that I use with, with my clients in coaching when, when, yes, we become aware that we're having contractive or challenging thoughts and emotions, and we, we don't want to make them wrong. We want to bring absolute compassion to them, but neither do we want to stay there. So it's, it, I, I see focusing and again, this this probably wouldn't be how Gendlin would see it, but I see focusing as as a tool to allow me to to be um, compassionate towards everything that's there within me and that arises within me, but as a means for for just processing it to a certain extent and allowing the felt or allowing the the shift to take place so that I don't stay trapped in contractive emotions and thinking and and I think Gendlin kind of spoke to this a bit and I'm going to share another quote and these quotes come from his book um focusing oriented um psychotherapy um I'll come back to this in a minute this sorry oh, go back to that he, he talked about within the felt sense uh, uh, that there has to be that forward growth, that forward momentum, that that um, moving, moving beyond what is. And he says one develops as in one grows when the desire to live and do things stirs deep down, when one's own hopes and desire stir, when one's own perceptions and evaluations carry a new sureness when the capacity to stand one's ground increases and when we consider others and their needs. So I, I really believe that, you know, focusing as a tool in many respects is, is not just to be able to be in partnership or be in relationship with those emotions, but to actually move beyond them. So again, I don't know if this will feel like a provocation or feel like uh, something that, that you would agree with or relate to. But I, I really believe that all therapy really at its best has to be about moving forward and that, you know, understanding who I am and understanding my feelings and understanding, you know, how I got to be where I am is only part of the process. And, and, and the whole purpose really is to grow and become. So 
let me just pause that for a moment again. I, I'll share these slides afterwards if anybody wants to, you know, look at those quotes again. But maybe just pausing for a moment to see see where where you sit with with what I've just been suggesting. Sophie, I see your hand up there. So if you'd like to come in, just come off mute. No, this was a mistake. Sorry, sorry. Oh, okay. No worries. Well, maybe I'll come in here and please, Lynn. Of course. I'm. I'm so sorry. I was having my technological problems this morning. Um, <clears throat> I think that that. Uh, well, first of all, I I love the exercise since I was feeling so anxious about my <laughs> my techno technological problems, and it felt so good to wrap something around that part of me. Um, I I think that that from Jean's point of view, when you follow and uh, open the felt sense, even if it's something negative, that it it uh, organically carries forward and moves little step by little step, so yes. that from. Uh, from that point of view, you aren't moving beyond focusing, but the 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 focusing isn't just a tool to get in touch, but uh, it's it's also a way that the whole organism, including uh, the the spiritual momentum of development, um, that that is held and then moves forward and then you can be curious about it and interested in it so that what originally starts as negative uh i'm 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 so bad with technology and what's wrong with me and how could this be and that kind of thing uh if i follow it we'll say oh but look at you you usually do it and um, and this is a, a calling, this technology or, or whatever way. I didn't have time to, to follow it very, very far. Um, but I think that there can be a distinction <laughs> between a spiritual, many spiritual practices of sort of letting go um, and being in the big space and focusing, which which is sort of following through it to the big space. I don't know if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yes, to me it does. And I, I think sometimes, you know, putting language around it sometimes just makes it more complicated but and, and makes it seem different. But yes, I, I think it's all signposting us towards growth and 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 that next that next possibility yes i may have <clears throat> hi pauline um even though we're kind of uh, in in the same area we don't know each other i've only met you once and you know so yes. i'm really i really enjoyed our our conversation um just in the lead up to this what's a, what's emerging for me now is the the sense of that knowing presence it's like i think that that that's the one i don't know and that's the one that can be present to all of me or all something in me and i'm 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 beginning to get really excited about that now because i don't have to do the work now it's allowing that to come you know so it's what self and presence isn't me either you know and that there's something, thank God, a bit more intelligent <laughs> than what I had been bringing. And I'm not saying that just lightly to put myself down, but I think um, almost that was my conscience in some way, you know, and I felt awful. And I'm really curious about the 90 seconds, you know, because changes, you know, every 90 seconds and I can't get in there or be responsible for my felt sense all the time. So it becomes exhausting, you know. So, yeah, there's a new hope in me that that, um, and Jim lovely, uh, nicely pointed out something about um, uh, Gendlin uh, being recorded talking about the spot, you know. And, and I think this, I think 
in the listening and the first listening of it, the spot was maybe the felt sense, but we're more than the spot, you know, that we can, you know, we're not just the tangle or something is another name for it. So I'm delighted. I'm just just really enjoying this, Maeve. So thank you. Yeah. So I think, you know, when when I talked at the start saying or, or when you introduced me, Pauline, and, and kind of saying, you know, for my journey has been trying to understand how the world works for me. It makes sense. And, and again, I don't, you know, people don't have to subscribe to any particular faith system, but to know that there is an infinite intelligence at work in the world, that, mm -hmm. that it all actually does make sense. It makes yes. sense. And as, and as we, as we, you know, adopt that belief for ourselves and at the end of the day, you know, for each and every one of us here, we are the only person who does the thinking in our heads. OK, so you and I, we get to choose the thoughts that we're going to entertain and, and carry and 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 beliefs are just thoughts that we've, you know, had many, many, many times. So the thoughts and beliefs that we hold, we get to choose them. And, and for sure, as kids and growing up in whatever environment and, and whatever family and, and education and, and cultural and religious or spiritual environment we were brought up and we'll have absorbed a lot, an awful lot of thoughts and beliefs. But as adults, we get to say, well, you know, do I believe that, you know, what, whatever it is, and, and does it serve me to believe it? And if it doesn't, you we, we can choose a different belief. So even that that sense, Pauline, that, you know, I don't have to be in, I don't have to, you know, manage all of this. There is a higher power here at work as well. And I can tune into that awareness. And from that awareness, I can access that intelligence and access the insight. And then and then that allows me, you know, to to move forward in, in maybe more confident ways or, or, or just more supported ways and making choices. So, so again, you know, we get to choose, we get to choose the thoughts that we are having and we get to choose, I would say, so again, this is another provocation potentially that we get to choose our feelings. Okay. So a lot of the time we wake up in the morning and we're feeling a certain way. Typically our thoughts, you know, go to what do I have to do today? Or, you know, our thoughts, we're, we're going to have the, the, the dominant thought patterns that we've adopted over many, many months and years. And, and based on that, we'll have a certain reaction to the day, you know, and I and like, you know, great, yay, you know, it's my birthday, it's a great day, or I'm, you know, I'm seeing my kids today or my grandkids, or I'm doing work that I love today, great, or, you know, we look out and, and the weather, you know, the snow is a foot deep already. And now I'm going to have to dig my way out and it's going to be a tough day. And, and, and those thoughts lead us to, to respond to the day in, in certain ways. I think, I think we, we don't have to be uh, in reactivity like that. It, it's, it's a fundamental belief of mine that I get to choose Okay, I'll come back to that in see in a moment. Okay, um, I get to choose. So I don't in in the context of grief, for example, usually grief is in response to something that's happened in my life. So we don't get to choose what happens. We don't get to choose every event, every person, every every circumstance we find ourselves in at all. I, I fully respect that. We do get to choose our response, though, and and again, I would I would say. And, and I say this with utmost respect, that we, we get to choose. We get to choose how I'm going to be in any given moment in, in response to what's happening in our lives. And sometimes that feels like reaction and sometimes that feels like response. And, you know, Viktor Frankl's work um, in, in Man's Search for Meaning, and, and he talked about, you know, the last remaining freedom to the individual human is their response to the situation. And, and that's a big ask sometimes to, to, to hold that for ourselves that, you know, I get to choose my response. Um, but I, I believe there is a fundamental freedom in that and um, focusing for sure can help us to, to be with those responses and, and to navigate them. 
So yeah, maybe I'll just I'll just pause on that and then I I'll come back. I want to share something called the results formula in a moment. But um, if there's if there's something present there for you, in C, is it in is that how I say your name or is it Ali or I'm not sure. But if you'd like to come in, Hi, I'm happy sorry, to. Inji, Inji, Inji. Hi. There's no way of knowing that. I mean, I spell it with a C, so you can, but. But it's it's Inji. Thank you. Inji. Um, Thank that you. That was. Uh, let me think about what you just said. Um, well, I I don't want to take up time. It is it, it, it. You do get to choose your response. However, I think uh, grief is still in another category of its own. It's not, you know. If a family member dies, it's not something in me. It's something that overtakes me. It's that simple. Yeah, and, and I suppose I would say, Ingie, that the, the overtaking is, is when I've become very identified with the feeling. I, I, I've, I've become the feeling. And... And, and that feels very real in those moments and any feeling that overtakes us or that we become completely identified with can be very overwhelming. And, and, and in those moments, it is, it is very real and it does feel like there's no choice in the matter. But if we, if we can, if we can move to, a, a, and again, this is, this, this is a, a choice and B, um, I suppose, or, yeah, what I was going to say is if we can move to that it's a part of me rather than all of me. Again, if if I can come back to that, you know, there there is a spiritual side to my nature that is is bigger than anything in my human experience. Then that sometimes can allow me to to be with the grief and, and not overtaken by it. But again, depending on where we're at in our grief journey, that that doesn't always feel possible as a choice to make. It doesn't mean that it's not available to us, though. I'd like to say something. Uh, my name is BJ first. I can't thank Hi, you. BJ. Enough. I just can't thank you enough. Uh, thank you. You've given us such a rich feast. And at, at, at this moment, there's a part of me that came up earlier as well. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a part that says, I'm, I'm worried because there's not readiness or preparedness for such a, a, a great feast. And that uh, this part of me says, they're going to forget about the turkey because we've already gone through the whole meal now. And so what I do is comfort that part of myself. Yes. And, and then I'm able to say something more reasonable, uh, if you want to use that term. There's so many modalities and methods to talk about this thing you're talking about. And the little part rose in me first when you were using spiritual language. Oh, no, they're not going to get the turkey because most of us, many of us don't, oh, don't trust that language. And then there was the woo woo, the energy and oh, no, many of us don't trust that language. Um, but I hear you. I, I'd like to say just in one minute, my current methodology, which is uh, neuroscience, and it's too just a guess. But I, I like to believe that there's a human capacity for healing and that it's in the brain somewhere so that when I have a uh, when I'm overtaken by an emotion and I'm acting out in some way, it's not serving me that I'm acting out. And so hopefully I get it surrounded by an environment that uh, help, helps me to hold that emotion. And, and it's just that my brain then remembers another path. My brain remembers, oh yeah, that's that emotion that's in me since the evolution of humankind and because of things like focusing i'm able to more and more train my brain to go somewhere else with that emotion and, and then i won't say more about that but about grief i want to say i believe that grief and there are some other ones are not emotions 
Grief is, I believe, a physiological response of the body, like those babies in orphanages who die because they are not touched. That grief is a whole different thing by itself. And uh, it, I don't want to say more than that, except NC, yes, yes, yes. You do not choose that in my belief, any more than you choose to cut your arm open. It's a physiological response to loss that makes me pay attention and serve, I don't, not serve myself, but serve all of us more because I see that injury and I'm giving it time to heal itself. That's it for me. Thank you all for listening. Thanks, BJ. And Lenore, I see you with your hand there. Thank you. Um, I also want to say sometimes, like with grief, it's important to allow the feelings, even if they're very painful. Yeah. And, and sometimes, you know, it's impossible to step back from it. It's such an overwhelming presence um, and feeling. And I agree with what you're saying. It's a physiological um, the PJ, what you were saying, it's a physiological thing. And sometimes things are physiological. And in that presence, it doesn't feel like there's a choice. But I also think it's important to go through it, to get to the other side of it. And sometimes there's a time to step back from emotions, feelings that can sweep us away and times to be with it and go through it to get to the other side. Yeah, I would agree. And, and for sure, focusing gives us a great way to be with it. Absolutely. Liz. Hi, thank you for talking about parts. And now we're talking about grief. And I maybe this is my failing in requiring a sort of logical consistency in thinking about systems. But first of all, I was going to say something else, but then grief came up. And for me, I wouldn't need to ghettoize grief and think that it's, oh, it's this other thing that I would rather, you know, I don't think you need to do that. I think that it's it's really not hard at all to see grief as, if you see emotions as body that and or it's also other things but i i think that it's i don't know that you have to put it in a corner somewhere i think it can go into a category with separation really easily loneliness the longing i you know so much and why am i saying that well maybe it could be helpful to say well mine's grief so i'm in this other category of humans now feeling grief but that it's more of a universal thing. And maybe when we're saying grief, the volume is turned up very high, but it doesn't mean that the sound waves are of a completely different nature from other emotions. Anyway, that's just my thought. But it also segues into parts, which I think are clever and find helpful sometimes. But I also have trouble with it because it makes me feel like a car. When I think of my parts, it feels like it's the opposite of a kind of coming to a wholeness. I, well, that's that part. And then I feel like I should take it to an auto mechanic or have it CAT scanned or, you know, and I, I wonder how to integrate this parts way of life yeah. with an integrated part of life and you know it just it gets all complicated if you want to get into philosophy and not just sort of practical psychology that even to say i'm this and i get to choose this feeling is helpful again a heuristic a nice metaphor but also is there any limitation in these divisions that we seem to need to do in order to help ourselves? Well, maybe I can respond in the first instance, Liz, and then others please come in as well. Um, 
so I, I think some of what you're describing is the challenge in the language. Okay. So, you know, part of me, so that, you know, that feels mechanical in some way. So, so sometimes I, I think it's Anne Weiser Cornell that, you know, she would use the phrase something in me or, or, and sometimes what I would use is I'm noticing, I'm noticing, I'm feeling this way. And, and that, you know, whether it's part of me or a lot of me or all of me in that moment, it's just, I'm noticing the grief. I'm noticing, you know, the, the, the feeling like I'm being asked to carve myself up into, into bits. So, so the language, you know, I, my suggestion would be to, to not get too caught up in the language and just to find to find words that sit with you in terms of how you can kind of relate to the emotion without feeling overwhelmed by it. Yeah. And in, in, in terms of just coming back and acknowledging what you were saying about grief as well, I, I, I do think that, you know, there's, and we've all had an experience, it's not always related to grief, but we've all had a time, I'm sure, where, where there was an emotion or, or a response or a reaction in us to something that was happening in our lives. And, and we're kind of like, on this occasion, and, and this time, it's just too much. And, and this time, I can't just make it a part of me or, or find compassion for it or be okay with it or be in relation to it. For some of us, that's grief, but not for everybody. And if we look at, you know, grief too is on a spectrum and some people manage their grief in, in ways that, that, you know, others would say, how, how, how can they do that so easily? And, and others would, would say it's, it's something you can never recover from. And, and again, it's, there's, there's no, there's no absolutes in this. We all have our own response to it there is no required way to be with any of it. And it doesn't go to any required level of intensity or any required duration. And I would say that's true of, of every response and every emotion that we experience that, that, you know, like each of us has to do it in the way that is right for us. And, and, and we navigate that. Going back to the spiritual side, I mean, I believe when, when I feel supported in that journey, that there is there is a, you know, an intelligence that can help me with all of that, that that supports me in, in finding the best of me in responding to it. But, you know, again, each to their own in terms of that. But language, I think, again, it's Eckhart Tolle, and I'm sure you all know his work, The Power of Now and, and The New Earth. But, you know, he talks about the language is just a signpost. So we don't want to get caught up. This, this is what I would say and what I say to my clients. We don't want to get caught up in the language, especially if it's not serving you. You know, so just just find a formula of words that does fit and that does support you. That would be my recommendation. Anybody else want to come in on, um, on, on this? Yeah. Yes. It's me, just in case you don't see my little hand, because it's kind of hidden up there. Oh, it is a bit. Yes. <laughs> so I, yeah, I, good uh, job. <laughs> um, I want to apologize for the fact that I have to go in and out, but I have elders who are centenarians. So when the phone rings, I get very overwhelmed. I think something happens, so I have to leave. So I missed part of it, but... I just wanted to say, so I um, I work with grief and I've trained in um, prolonged grief, which is grief that feels like never ending. And, um, you know, the beauty of grief training is that they say, you know, grief is um, a manifestation of the love we have for, you know, the person that's gone, that grief is an act of love. And that for some people, and maybe for most of us, grief will never leave. It just changes as ebb, ebb and flow in our bodies. You know, it might not be as intense. But um, the kind of therapy that I do is called internal family systems. And the first six steps of IFS is actually focusing, which is really interesting to me that they kind of merged it. And IFS is parts work. And parts are all the multiple thoughts, feelings, sensations, and memories we have in our bodies and all parts are welcome, they say, every part of us is welcome. And when it comes to grief, what I've learned is that there's grief, but then there are parts that don't, that try to protect us because every part has a good intention. And what I've learned with grief is that some people feel if they 
if they start experiencing joy and living life, that they're not grieving the beloved, that somehow they've moved on, they're going to forget them. So parts of them kind of like keep them in this state of like if the grief is happening, even though it's been like five or six years, because they're so afraid of moving forward. So, you know, grief work is a slow process with this ebb and flow. People will eventually get to a place where they're doing things, but but still the grief is there and they could kind of live with it, but still have these moments and pockets of of being present with life the way life is. That's yeah. Thank you. But I mean that's helpful to to see it in that way. And I don't I don't know if Inji wants to come back or respond to any of that or are you okay with where we're at in the conversation? I'm taking it all in. Uh, one of the thoughts I'm having is um I, I don't want to spend a lot I one of the thoughts I'm having is uh the language doesn't work for me. Pausing works better. Just simply pausing. But I, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so trust that, Inji. Trust yeah. that. But, yeah. Um, no, it's just. So it, it's uh, it's a lot to process for me right now, and I'm 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 listening to what you're saying, and yeah. Thank you. Thank you too. Okay. So let me just, I, I'm just conscious of time and, and not sure if we need to go to breakout or if people, I mean, Lynn, you tell me what, what or yeah. Pauline, give me some advice in terms of what yeah. you think is. This might be a good moment to go into breakout rooms because I think everybody has stuff <laughs> that has arisen. And, uh, um, and so then everybody gets a, a chance to share and and sort of yes so I, I think this would be a good moment it's a quarter after nine so maybe we would uh have uh 15 minutes or Please. 20 minutes yeah sure i mean I, again i will go with I, i'm available to stay as long as we need to be here so I'll, I'll wait on at the end as well so what if 20 minutes yeah sure um somebody said something maybe uh does that seem right to you jim we'll come back at uh at 9 35 and have 10 minutes to process what happened in the breakout rooms sounds good to me okay well uh we'll have uh three people in a breakout room and thank you again so much Mae. this is so rich brought so much folks i'm i'm new to the process so i'm not sure lynn do you kind of manage this piece to take feedback or or what do you want to happen now Pauline is going to read your poem too. Ah, okay. Someone. Yeah. Someone. Yeah. But well, that will that, be at the end. That's that at the, the end. end. Yeah. yeah. And it's yeah. a good time to mention Dorothy. I know she's listening in as well. Lots of love. Yeah. That's at the end. And it's Maeve's poem that she has chosen. Right. Well, this group is very self organizing. So uh, we're just inviting everybody to say uh, something about what you experienced in your breakout room and we don't have to manage it very much. <laughs> so um, sure. everybody's welcome. One of the things that came up in our group is the, that the comment that was made that if the belief doesn't serve you well, change the belief. And while that's a wonderful idea, not so easy to do. Okay, so can I respond to that? And Robert, absolutely. I agree 100%. It's not easy to do, but so we change a, we change a belief through repetition. Okay, so if I, if I choose a new belief, everything in your body is going to be and in, in your mind is going to be fighting the new belief. It's not and so so oftentimes we give up on a new belief because we're not feeling it. And, and I would say the, the work here is, is to just stay in the repetition of it. So that as we repeat the thought, it becomes a belief and feelings follow thought. 
So as, as I, as I stay in the repetition of the new belief over time, I start to believe it and I start to feel it. So well observed. It, yeah, it is hard to do and it doesn't feel right initially, but that's because, you know, we've maybe got 30, 40, 50 years of thinking a different thought, which has become the habitual and, and, and the, the comfortable. So the new thought is going to feel uncomfortable initially until we establish it as, as a new belief. And we do that through repetition. I, I, I have I have felt that I have found that to be very true with self-compassion statements, mm. things there that I go. didn't necessarily yes. believe in my head, but I kind of knew it in my heart. But I yes. repeated, repeated, Beautiful. repeated them and I, I came to believe them. Beautiful. Yes. Thank you. I, I think also that uh, that Nancy, when you say your head and your heart, that uh, even if we don't like the language of parts, and I don't like it either, there's voices. Uh, Greg Madison calls that the inner democracy, and the dialogue between them really helps. So your head says something, and then your heart says something, and I think it's asking into why this other one doesn't want to believe something that you think is true, you know, or why it's holding on to the old belief when the new one seems uh, in your heart to be more of, of who you really are or something. So complicated. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think on, uh, if we want to short circuit at least, what I would say is, you know, that part that is, you know, holding on to the old belief or whatever, it's wanting to protect you from something. And I, I mean, you can. This is where maybe I, I kind of diverge a bit from the focusing route. I, I don't know that there's a huge amount to be achieved just from knowing what it is that it wants to protect you from I, I think we can just get very firm and say I choose the new belief I choose the new belief and and put our attention and our focus on that but I, I know you know <clears throat> there's probably insight to be found in understanding that other part and I guess if it's if it's being very resistant then you, you have to do the work to, to allow it to have that felt shift and that forward momentum again. I'd like to suggest that uh, the trick is to feel things freshly. If you feel them freshly, uh, then you're not stuck. If you know in advance how it has to turn out, then you're stuck and you're, you have your handle and you're gonna hold on to it for dear life. You need to yeah. say, well, let me get rid of this handle and see what what's going on in me and feel it freshly. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Yes, I would agree. I there are so many layers of whether you want to be. It's like, we, what's the motivation for changing from belief one to belief two? Because there are so many people who have beliefs now that make them feel more comfortable, more at peace, more whole. And um, that and, and a lot of those people with those beliefs um, are voting for fascist le world le leaders and they're very comfortable with those. You know, like I think it has to go beyond the what do you want to believe in and what are your motives? And it's just so hard to rise above and figure it out and then figuring it out is its own problem because now you're figuring it out and you're in the world of concepts so i i don't know i guess for me I, making being comfortable with how hard it all is is a for me it's a kind of first step and not thinking that there's a way but more like oh <laughs> being human is among other humans it's like, not easy. Ah, being a human among other humans is not easy. And maybe that's the compassion, right? <laughs> we could probably do a whole other call just on, yeah, on response absolutely. to that, Liz. Yes. I, I, I 
want to put a tiny ray of light on uh, Bob's comment and, and the pursuing comments about how hard it is sometimes to keep choosing. And just to say that sometimes it does just change. And that's a part, a huge part of what focus thing makes happen. That's why I keep advocating that we ought to get together and talk about shifts that really happened. Where, and to my mind, the, the brain, you know, encountered something faster or slower. But and maybe some of you have had that. I have had that where I would, I was sure I would never get past this. And I have a focusing session with somebody and it just goes. Something that I've carried for five, six, 10 years. And of course there was growth happening, healing unconscious to me. But last night I focused with Beth Mailer and she gave me this image and I put my hands on that image and I let go of it. And by watching her hands let go of it, I let go of it. That was only something I've had for two years, but I mean, I've let go of something I had for seven years once. So sometimes we have to just keep doing this, Bob, God, yes. And I'm doing that about a bunch of stuff too. But the promise of focusing for me is that sometimes it just happens. And the way Ann talks about that is Ann says, I don't really know. I just woke up that morning and it was gone. After years of having this thing, she said, I just woke up one morning and it was gone. And focusing, that's my, that's my path right now. Thanks. Yeah. I, thank you so much, BJ. I just want to say that for me, the miracle of focusing, because I'm, I've been new to it, you know, for the past few years, and it was really a new tool for me, is that I feel heard. There's a part of me that needed to feel heard. And focusing gives that ability to feel heard. And mm -hmm. even if I change my belief, there's still something inside that might not have felt like it got heard. And so the focusing questions that I used with myself, I would use those focusing questions, you know, at night and they'd help me go to sleep because something inside mm -hmm. yeah. was bothering me. And then with a focusing partner, there's something that it's, a, it's kind of miraculous. There's something that feels heard that suddenly can shift or go a little deeper and then get to the core. So that for me is the miracle of this. And I'm very new to it, you know, but I I really appreciate it, yeah. Thank you for saying oh. that. I love your phrase, it feels heard. It feels heard. Um, I, I'll, this is Ro, um, yeah. I, I also appreciate what you just said, BJ, because it seems that our emotions want freedom. They, you know, they don't want to be stuck when you say it left or it let go or, uh, you know, yeah, it wants freedom. It, it, it does not really not interested in being caged in some state, you know, static, uh, painful place. I think from everything we've been talking about, that's what's coming to me. I'd like to introduce one other piece very quickly here, and, and that is, if, and this is, I'm just thinking of this in the spur of the moment. If we want to change a belief, the brain does a little survey uh, unconsciously about all the things that support that belief. If we want to change the belief, can we create new circumstances, new memories, new experiences for the brain then when it does a survey to see those, not just the old ones? So uh, I would say briefly that, yes, and it, we don't even have to really do that ourselves. We have a part in the brain called the reticular activating system. So whatever we're putting our energy on and our attention on, the reticular activating system seeks to find more evidence of that and, and it pushes out anything that's extraneous to that. So you'll all have had this experience if, if you were going to buy a new car, for example, and you know maybe you you know, a lot of different types of cars now, but say, imagine you used to have a Ford car, which lots of people in Ireland would have, and now you've decided you're going to go for, um, I don't know, a Kia. All of a sudden you see Kias every place there, you know, your neighbor has one and they're in the parking lot at the grocery store and they're in the line at, at the traffic jam. 
they're everywhere. And that's the reticular activating system at work. And it's the same when I when I am, you know, working off a particular belief, it's showing me evidence of that everywhere on, on TV and on, on the in the newspapers, you know, everywhere I go, conversations overheard. When I change the belief and I'm feeding that belief with my energy, with my attention, that same reticular activating system is going to go scanning to shape, you know, show Maeve the evidence of that, show Rob the evidence of that. So that's that's how it works. So absolutely, we have this kind of um, confirmation bias. We all have it, but it's going to give us a bias to whatever it is we're putting our energy and focus and attention upon. So it'll happen automatically, Rob, once you once you give the energy to the, the new belief and the new thought process. It also works with negative beliefs. Correct. Yes. So, it doesn't oh, matter what the belief is. Oh, so a word of caution. I, I think we it's time for our poem. We we lost track a little bit here. So uh thank you so much, Maeve. And uh let's hear from Dorothy. From Katharina, maybe. Who's doing the poem? Dorothy is uh, not here. Pauline. Pauline. Yeah, I, I have. I said that I would be the one, oh, or I would be someone that would try and read it. You know. So, and this is a uh, Maeve's choice. Um, and uh, there's a link. Are you putting a link into where all of this, Maeve? I I put the PDF into the chat, yeah. and Great. it has a link to the poem as well. Well, I hope I can do it justice. Um, right now, there are Tibetan Buddhist monks in a temple in the Himalayas endlessly reciting mantras for the cessation of your suffering and the fl flourishing of your happiness. Mm -hmm. Someone you haven't met yet is already dreaming of adoring you. Someone is writing a book that you will read in the next two years that mm -hmm. will change how you love look at life. Mm -hmm. Nuns in the Alps are in endless vigils, praying for the Holy Spirit to alight the heart of all of God's children. Mm -hmm. A farmer is looking at his organic crops and whispering, Nour nourish them. Mm -hmm. Someone wants to kiss, hold, and to make tea for you. Mm -hmm. Someone is willing to lend you money, wants to know what your favorite food is, and treat you to a movie. Mm -hmm. Someone in your or orbit has something immensely valuable to give you for free. Thanks, Maeve. Something has been invented this year that will change how your generation lives, communicates, heals, and passes on. The next great song has been rehearsed. Thousands of people are in yoga classes right now, intentionally spreading light out from their heart chakras and wrapping it around the earth. Millions of children are assuming that everything is amazing, will always be that way. Someone is in profound pain, and a few months and a few months from now, they'll be thriving like just like never before. From where they are, they just can't see it. Someone who is craving to be partnered, to be acknowledged, to arrive, will get precisely what they want and even more. Mm -hmm. And because that gift will be so fantastical, it's in their reach and sweetness, it will quite magically alter their memory of angsty looking for and render it all. So worth the wait. Someone has recently cracked open their joyous, genuine nature because they did the hard work of hauling years of oppression off their psyche. Their luminous juju is floating in the ether and is accessible to you. Some are just the second wish for world's peace in earnest. Some civil service is making sure that you get your mail and your garbage is being picked up, that the trains are running on time and that you were genuinely safe. Someone is dedicating their days to protecting your civil liberties and clean drinking water. Someone is just regaining their sanity. Someone is coming back from the dead and someone is genuinely forgiving the seemingly unforgivable. Someone is curing the uncurable. You, me, someone now. And that's from Mary Standing Water. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you again, Nate. Oh, thank you so much. Bye-bye now.